than when we first begun. up a little bit and the rest comes from the word of God and Brother Bemis is going to preach it. All right, I just, uh, I'm an old sheep herder and an old sheep herder told me one night, he said, uh, preacher, you, you know, real sheepers, you know what they like to do? They like to look at the sheep. And so I just want to look at the sheep for a minute. Don't want to look at them. I enjoy looking at the sheep. That's what I am. I'm a sheep herder. My dad was a sheep herder. I was raised on a sheep ranch and grew up on a sheep ranch that had about uh, 600 acres and then it had a, another 2,000 acres up behind it right up from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And this year, 
I drove by that, that old ranch, not, yeah, well, this year, last year, I drove by that old ranch that my dad raised us kids on. And I stopped there and took a picture of the barn. The old barn was still there, right there where I was raised as a kid. Of course, it, it looks much smaller now than it did then. <laughs> and that was a barn uh, where my dad would uh, break horses, and my dad heard about uh, 6,000 head of sheep. And uh, I, I said to myself, I'm a sheep herder at heart. I hate cows. I hate horses. I like sheep. And I just want to kind of look at the sheep tonight. And the pastor, the shepherd, is to feed the sheep. And he's to tell them of something about the great shepherd. And tonight I want to tell you something about the great shepherd, and I want to draw you close to the chief shepherd. So tonight I'm going to preach on uh, this text in Ezekiel chapter, Zechariah chapter 13. Take your Bible and turn to Zechariah. Zechariah with me. Uh, Zechariah chapter 13, and I guess every preacher that's ever preached has uh, preached uh, this at some time or another. Zechariah chapter 13, and I now want you to mark verse 13. And this is connected with a Christian, by the way, a Christian. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds? Now, I underline the word wounds, and then in the margin of your Bible, draw two hands and put a hole in this hand and a hole in this hand. He said, what are these wounds? Remember what, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before I mess up. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray this evening by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, that you would please uh, speak to our hearts tonight, and I pray that you'd speak to each and every heart here. And I'd pray you give them some grace tonight, and I pray that you would remind them uh, about sin. Because, Lord, sin is one of those things that one of these days will be delivered from, and we haven't been delivered from it yet, <clears throat> Lord. Uh, I wish we were, but we're not. And one of these days we're going to be delivered from it, and one of these days we'll go into your presence and we'll sin no more. But, Lord, until that time comes, Lord, help us to fight against it, and, Lord, help us not to take it for granted, Father, that every time we do, we're sinning against your Son, Jesus Christ, and that our sins is why he died. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now I want to remind you, how many of you know without a shout of a doubt that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary and they put a nail in this hand, and they put him down on the cross and they slammed a nail through there and drove it in his hand, and they did the same thing on this head, they laid it there and drive a nail through that hand, that he did it for, what did he do, what did he do it for? I want everybody to go just like this. He did it for me. Come on, do it again. All of you, come on, brother. You too. <laughs> he did it for me. He did it for me. He did that for my sins. My sins. And now let me ask you, did he die for all your past sins? Did he die for all your present sins? Did he die for all your future sins? So all your sins were future when he died for them. So you are guilty of wounding Jesus. You are guilty of the thorns on his head. You are guilty of the nails in his hands. You are guilty of the stripes on his back. Bible says he was wounded for you and me. He died from you. Now, let's get the text. Verse, uh, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6. And one shall say to him, 
What are these wounds in thy hand? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So every time I sin, every time I sin, no matter what it is, from the biggest sin to the littlest sin, I'm guilty of, of wounding my Savior. Every time I sin, every time you sin, you're, you're guilty of wounding the Lord Jesus Christ. Past, present, and future. You know why I want to go to heaven when I die? So one of these days when I get there and that trumpet sounds, John, that trumpet sounds, I will go and get a brand new body, and I'll be raptured out of here, while I will never, ever sin again. You say, I want to go to heaven to see Jesus. I do too. I do too. I want to go there. I want to grab his hand, and I want to look in his hand. I do. And that's going to be a wonderful thing. I want to go see my mansion up there. I want to go in there and say, ha-ha, that's mine. <laughs> That's mine. I will look at myself and say, I got a body that will never die. It's immortal. Immortal. Now that's something, brother. Immortal. E now those things are all great. Say amen. amen. But that's not the best of the whole story. The best of the whole story is I can think Anything I want to think, I can say anything I want to say, I can do anything I want to do, and I'll never sin against my Savior. That's what makes heaven a wonderful place as far as I'm concerned. But we're not there yet. We're not yet there yet. We are here in the nasty now and now. And we are here where I sin. And every time I sin, I wound my Savior. And you need to keep that in mind, because you don't have the right attitude towards sin that you ought to have. None of us do. None of us do. None of us are anywhere close to the holiness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're far away from that. We don't hate sin. We're supposed to hate sin. We're supposed to hate it with a passion, and we don't do it. We kind of love it. We kind of like it. We kind of enjoy it. That's what's wrong with us. One of these days, I won't enjoy sin anymore. You say, preacher, enjoy sin? It says over there in the uh, book of Hebrews, he said, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So it has that tendency down in there to kind of enjoy sin. And that should not be so. Sin bothers you, and if you're right with the Holy Spirit, sin will bother you. And the closer you get to God, the more your sin will bother you. All right, now, I want you to take a passage of Scripture. I want you to turn to the book of Psalm Solomon, and turn to Psalm Solomon chapter 5. Uh, and it says, uh, Wounded in the house of my friends. And uh, turn over to Psalm Solomon now. And I kind of want to back that up with you so you will uh, absolutely uh, take it to heart. And uh, Psalm Solomon chapter 5, I want you to uh, look at uh, verse 16. Psalm Solomon chapter 5, verse 16. And this is talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his uh, bride that he's engaged to at this moment. So he's talking about himself and talking about you. You love Jesus. Let me hear you say, I love Jesus. I love he's the best one to be in love with. He's the right one to be in love with. He's worth loving. Now watch it. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved this is my what? Friend. Underline it. This is my friend. When you have a friend, you've got to know something about friends. Now, am I God's friend? Is he my friend? Or is this friendship an awful one-sided situation? 
Come on. I believe it's an awful one-sided situation. I mean, the Lord's much better to me and much gooder to me than uh, I am to him. Say amen. Now, if he's your friend, and he ought to be your friend, that friendship should not just be one-sided. Suppose I come up here and, and I'm your friend and I'm always borrowing something from you and getting something from you and always getting this and you're always helping me and you get in trouble and I say, well, I just haven't got time. What a kind of friendship is that? Say amen. That's a lopsided friendship. Now, I, I agree the friendship is lopsided, but I'm still his friend and he's still mine. Say amen. All right, now I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 32, and pick up verse 5. I want you to know for a certain day that you would, he was wounded in the house of his friends, and your wounded, your wounds, your sins, wound the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, every time you sin. You say, what are you trying to put on me? I'm trying to put on you holiness. I'm trying to put on you to have a fight towards sin. I'm trying to put on you something that will say, I'm going to fight with sin like tooth and nail. I want to get the victory over this, uh, uh, this thing here, and I want to quit this thing if I possibly can before the rapture occurs. Hey, because the rapture, you'll be sinless. After the rapture, you don't even have to try to get victory over sin. Say amen. I want to quit something. I want to quit it now. I, the Lord will quit it for me when I go to heaven, but I want to quit it for him now. You know what some Christians think? I, a preacher, I can do this thing and God won't kill me. You can. How many of you know you can do something and God won't kill you? Very well. You can do all kinds of things God won't kill you. In fact, God won't even talk to you about it sometimes. But it's not that way. It should be this way. It's not how much can I get away with and do this and do this and do this and do this and before God just kills me. But how much can I give up for him just because I love him? How much can I quit just because I love him? When you love somebody, you know what you want to do? You want to do something for them. I tell my wife I love her. She says, show me. If I come in the house, I take my coat, take my coat off, and I go. I take my shoes, flip them off. She gives it that look, you know. And she ain't going to pick it up. You know what I do? I go and say, I love you, dear. I'm going to hang my coat up in the closet and put my shoes in the closet. Now, that's not, that's not natural for me. <laughs> that's not my nature. My nature is I'm a slob by nature. <laughs> I was born that way, raised that way, and I like to be that way. But my wife's not that away. She's particular. If I get a little spot on me, she says, you got a spot on your tie. I said, no, yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm eating. She says, you're slobbering. I said, is it all right to slobber? <laughs> See, that's me. But I know it bugs her to death. Well, I'm going to be nice and sweet. She said, when you go out at Art Martin's, you keep your hand off of the table. <laughs> I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> Have you ever seen a train wreck in a tunnel? Fill your mouth full of food and then go... My wife says, you're gross. <laughs> See, it's 
it's natural for me. So you know what I do? Round my wife, when I'm round my wife, I go, keep my hand under the table. I smile and I eat one food full at a time. When she's not there and there's nobody looking, ooh, man, can I eat? Kind of like a mix it up all in there at once. See, but you've loved somebody, you don't do that. Because they have to look at you. Anybody with me? So when you love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you get in a sin and you say, shall I do this or shall I not do this? You say, I love him. Let me hear you say, I love him. Now, will you stop that thing just because you love him? If the doctor told you, if you don't quit, you're going to get cancer. Would you quit? Some of you say, I wouldn't quit if he told me I was going to get cancer. I wouldn't quit. Would you quit if the Lord told you to quit? Awful quiet. No amens now. You know what you ought to say? You ought to say, I'm going to quit just for the Lord because i got something I want to do for Him just before I die. I want to do something for Him. I want to quit one more sin. Ask God to show you a new sin. I believe in getting a new sin because you all got rid of the old one, got rid of the old one, got rid of the old one, and you probably got a new one you don't know anything about and say, Lord, please show me my sin I don't know anything about. Well, yes, sir, e Bob. If God showed you all your sins at once, you, let's say you got this hurdle to jump, you got over that sin, you quit drinking. That's good, amen, brother, amen. And then you got over the sin of cussing. That's another hurdle to get over. Man, that's a real hurdle to get over. It didn't take me about five seconds to get over that one, though. <laughs> and well, I'll tell you how I got over that hurdle. I used to cuss. Because I came up in school and I didn't want nobody to know that I was dumb and stupid. So I cussed to cover it up. Any man who cusses is a dumb, stupid man. And he's, covering the, he's covering up his stupidity, and that's why he cusses. You're welcome. I love you, too. <laughs> I know. That was me. <laughs> Boy, could I cuss. Boy, I, could, I was a sailor. I could turn the wall red. And a guy one time, I'd been saved about two weeks, and I had a Gideon New Testament, and I was going flip-flop, flim-floppers, I... Now, this is a great book. <laughs> Flim floppers flew, and there's another and, and the, and I said, boy, this is a goat. This is God's book. I mean, some inside, and I had no lump. And a guy saw me, and he, he come up on the other side, and I was on this side of the bunk in the Navy, and he said to this other sailor, is that Nathan a Christian? Is that Bemis a Christian? And that guy said, he ain't no Christian, he cusses. And it was just like somebody had taken a pocket knife and stuck it right down in me. I could feel it. I could feel it. I mean, cut me, boy, God, right down in my heart. I bowed my head right there and said, oh, God, oh, God, you know I'm a Christian. You know I am. And I want you to take all that cussing right out of my mouth and out of my heart. You know how long it took him to do it? <laughs> that fast. <laughs> he took it away. And that was all them words, boy. Every single one of them words. And I knew a whole hand full and a pocket full and a shirt pocket full and a side pocket full. And I had a, a backpack full of cuss words. And the Lord took them all away in one split second. You know why? Because I didn't just ask him to do it here. I asked him to do it here. I said, Lord, take away those cuss words. You know, son, and I'm, I got a sin right now that I'm asking to take away. Because my wound, I'm wounded in the house of my friends. My sins wound him. And your sins wound him. Sin number one, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. 
Ephesians chapter 5, sin number 1. Here is the sin that he was wounded in the house of his friends. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, rather. Did I say 5? That's the wrong chapter. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verse 5. Anybody got a napkin? Big napkin? If we got a handkerchief. Anybody got a tile? Yeah, that's what I need, brother, right there. That's what I need. This place is going to boil up here in a minute. And it's getting as hot as I can feel it already, getting hot and screaming hot. And do you mind if I blow my nose on it? You go ahead and keep that, brother. <laughs> oh, I can keep it. Oh, all right. You say, what, what are you doing? I'm just cooling down, just wiping down, just getting ready to sweat here in a minute, and i got to get prepared for that. You say, you're gross. That's me. That's me. I'm gross. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to be perfect and sinless. Say amen. Perfect and sinless. Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to look at verse 30. Verse 30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. You're not to grieve Him. Whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. So He doesn't leave the verse. He Right in the verse He says two things. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, and then the Lord knows you will. So he says, whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. He says, don't sin, but he knows you probably will. So he says, you're sealed into the day of redemption. So he don't want you to worry about where you go when you die. You don't have to worry about where you go when you die. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's not going to leave you. He said, that, he said all that in one verse. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, grieving the Holy Spirit begins up there with verse 25 and goes all the way to verse 32. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. So you have the Lord on this shoulder. Now, go back there and uh, look at verse 27. Look at verse 27. You got the devil on this soldier. Solar. Listen on this over here. <laughs> Neither give place to what? The devil, verse 27. Verse 30, you got the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, you got the devil. So when you give place to the devil, you go this way. So he's here, and the Lord's there, and the Lord says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and you're going to grieve me. And the devil's right in there saying, give place, give place. Let me have this, let me have this, let me have this. Now you see how the Lord put the two together? Say Amen. You ever seen a little picture of a devil on this shoulder? And an angel on this shoulder? Ever seen? Anybody, how many saw a picture of that somewhere? That's the way it is. That's the way it is, except it's inside. It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit inside saying something. And then the devil, he gets place, he wants to get in there too. But, being you've been cut apart and your soul has been, been cut away from your body... Then when your body sins, your soul don't sin. You've been circumcised. You've been cut apart. So the devil can mess with you while the Holy Spirit's still inside you. Anybody with me? Say amen. Now, I want you to look at verse 25. Wounded in the house of my friends. Wherefore, putting away Lying, you give draw a lie, put away lying. Draw down to verse uh, twenty-seven. Neither give place to the devil. When you lie, you automatically give place to the devil. You automatically grieve the Holy Spirit. So every time you tell a lie, no matter what it is. Now the question is, what is how important is it for a man not to lie? How many of you Christians have wounded Jesus? And put a wound in his hand by telling a lie. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll give you one more time. How many of you, since you've been saved, have lied? Raise your hands. Bunch of liars. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. 
we're all in the same boat. Why does a guy lie? Why does he lie? Why does he wound the Savior? Why does he do that? He doesn't know how important a lie is and how important the truth is. God loves a man who will tell the truth. God hates a man who will lie. You know what we do? We lie to cover up. We lie to make ourselves look good. You say, lie to your wife. Wait till a man starts lying to his wife. It, you ladies, is it all right if your husband lies to you? Not in that much of a lie will you stand for. Say amen. You will not stand for a lie. Unsaved people in this town will tell you it's wrong to lie. And yet Christians will still lie. Now, I want to give you an example of how important it is not to lie. Turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. And in Genesis chapter 38, look at verse 26. Genesis chapter 38. And pick up verse uh, 26. Now, if you think I'm going to tell you an illustration of how I lied, you're nuts. Because I'm not going to tell you any of my sin and tell you my lie. You'll say, man, that guy lies all the time. That ain't, that, that ain't the deal. Cause mine, just because I tell one, I, I do it this way. I tell a little white lie here. A little white lie here, a little white lie here, a little white lie. No, I don't. I try by my best to make them no little white lies. I believe a little sin is just as bad as a big one. I believe a little bitty lie, just a little bitty like that, lie like that is just as bad as a great big lie. I believe they're terrible for you and, you, you and me. Now, uh, turn to Genesis and turn to Genesis chapter 38 and look at verse 26. Now here's a man that I'm sure was tempted to lie, but he didn't lie. In Genesis chapter uh, 38, uh, if I can find it, yeah, it's over here. Genesis chapter 38, and look at verse uh, 26. How many are there? Oh, you're pretty good. 38, 26. It says, and Judah, Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you all the things that back up that thing. Judah, his wife died, his wife died, and Judah went out and he went up a ways and he went up there and Judah saw a woman on the roadside that was daughter-in-law, pretending to be a harlot. And Judah played the whore. He become messing with a whore. Anybody with me? How many know your Bible and read the story? Say amen. amen. And he left, went home, said to his friend, you better go back and pay her. You better take it back there and pay her because she's liable to tell everybody what I did. And I don't want nobody to know that. Go back there and pay her. He went back and couldn't find her. You with me? Say amen. He came back. She ain't there. All lo and behold... Up shows this woman and says, I'm pregnant with child. What would have Judah done? Judah should have said, in our estimation of it sometimes, Why? Burn her! She's a whore! Now Judah, that old boy says, I am no better than a harlot. I'm guilty as that as myself. Don't do nothing. You know what God did? God looked down over heaven like that and looked down over heaven. Judah, Judah, that's the tribe I'm going to get from. I'm going to bring my son from the tribe of Judah. All the rest of the boys bombed out. 
So Jesus Christ is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Because Judah told the truth and didn't lie. Ain't that something? When he could have lied to God, get out of it. He doesn't lie. And the Lord says, I love a man that will tell the truth when it makes him look like a thief and a robber and a fornicating whore, and he still tells the truth. That's what God loves. He loves a man to tell the truth. And it make you look like something terrible. He loves, he loves the truth. And yet, he hates a lie. God hates a lie. Christian? Wounded! Wounded! In the house of my friends! That's my sin. And that's your sin. That wounds the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians. And turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 4. And Ephesians chapter 4... It says, uh, verse uh, 25, Wherefore, putting away lies, speaking of a man truth with his neighbor, for our members one of another, and be ye angry, and sin not. There it goes. Wounded in the house of my friends. Did it say, did it say to be angry? Did it say to be angry? It says, be ye angry, and sin not. So right in the margin of your Bible, it's what do you get angry about? What do you get angry about? That's the key to it. We're supposed to get angry at what? Righteous indignation. We're supposed to get angry at sin. When's the last time you was mad at sin? When's the last time you saying? Why do I do that? Why do I do that? Why do I do that? Oh, God, why do I do that? You're the biggest dummy I've ever met. Why do you do that? When's the last time you got mad at this guy right here? For doing something you know that's going to kill him. Sin kills this man right here. Sin kills him. And my body is said to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. And every time I do something that de de devours that body, every time I take that body and use it for myself, I'm sinning against my Savior. I'm wounding His hands. Do you present your body a living sacrifice? Is your body a living sacrifice and wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service? It's supposed to be. I'm supposed to take care of it. It's God's temple. How many of you know that your body is God's temple? Say amen. amen. That means the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. That means you're to take care of this temple. That you're to treat it right. You're to, you're to uh, live a healthy life. And you're to not... Overdo nothing. You say, well, preacher, I went and man, I had a good lunch today. But I pigged out. I mean, I ate and I ate and I ate until I was almost sick. That's called gluttony. You say, I only did it one time. Well, that's okay. You only did it one time. It's still a sin, isn't it? And here's a Christian who does it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and he's a great big round ball with two eyes. Some of you are grieving God with your sin. It's hurting Him. You with me? Some of you have a sin that God wants you to quit. Wants you to get rid of it. Wants you to stop it. Wants you to stop it. It's a preacher. I'll never get to victory. Well, then I want you to do this. 
I want you to go down in the logs of God Almighty, and God has logged your sin, and He logged it down, and you go down the logs of God Almighty as you fighting it till the day you die. Whether you get the victory or not. You say, I, I have never got the victory. Fight it until the trumpet sounds. But you be fighting it. Don't you ever step back and say, well, I can't quit. Then you know the best time to quit sin is right now. You didn't have got a lock on you. If, you. if the devil comes along and whispers something in your ear, and he will, he'll whisper something in your ear. Yes, he will. If he does, you say, I'm not starting, so I don't have to worry about quitting. When your sin is like this, it's like a little string. Now, boys and girls, look right at me. Draw your two fingers and get your piece of string and wrap it around those two fingers one time. Then break it. You can 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 break it. Just snap it just like that. But sin's like this. Wrap it around there. Three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty, sixty, seven, seven, eight, and nine, till the fingers turn black and blue. And then say, I'm gonna break that baby. You ain't gonna break it. That's what sin is. You do it once, you do it twice, 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 you do it once, you do it twice. And then you can't quit! You do that ten for sixty years, the next ten years you'll have a fit trying to quit it. But you should. You should, you should. Wounded in the house of my friends. Where uh, verse twenty four, wherefore put away verse twenty five, wherefore put away lying, speaking every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members one or another. Be ye angry and sin not. And let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Then if a man gets mad at his wife, he how long is he supposed to stay mad? Let not the sun go down upon his wrath. It's all right to get mad at your wife. You just can't stay mad. You can't go to bed mad. You've got to forgive each other before you go to bed. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you're to get over it, you say, you get over it, get over it, and, and you've got to make up. You've got to learn how to make it up. Making up is the best part. <laughs> making up. Why? Because inside your heart you're saying, I love her, I love her, I love her, I love her, I love her. You know the blessing of forgiving somebody, forgiving him, forgiving her, is when you get to the heaven, you'll say, Lord, I forgive him. Now, this is going to do something wrong. He's going to do something stupid. Yes, he will. I guarantee it. <laughs> he will. <laughs> but you are to forgive him and tell you, him that he's forgiven. Vice versa, Dennis. She's going to do something stupid. Yes, she will. I know you don't think she will, but she will. When she does, you forgive her. And you tell her so. Now you got it, people? You got it? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And when you won't forgive, you know what you do? You wound the Savior. You wound him. And you give place to the devil. He comes in and he gets grounds in your heart and in your life, in your mind, when you won't forgive. You get bitter. Again, look at verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let us not sin go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. That's what puts wounds in Jesus Christ. Let him that steal, steal no more. Stealing grieves the Holy Spirit and it wounds in his hands. Stealing. One time I was up at the club. I was playing racquetball. I was playing racquetball in there. And... Sean Scribner, he's a guy who used to be uh, my assistant, used to be my assistant.
He was in there playing racquetball too. And he had a little bitty thing of uh, shampoo. And he had left it in the shower. And he was out playing racquetball. And I went in there and saw it, opened it up, used that shampoo. I said, well, I wonder whose shampoo that is. It's gone now. <laughs> Set it back. <laughs> gone. I walked out, played racquetball, went back in. Sean said, who stole my shampoo? <sighs> Shall I tell him or not tell him? I ain't gonna tell him. I ain't gonna tell him. A thief don't want nobody to know he's a thief. You with me? Thief don't want nobody to know he's a thief. So he don't tell nobody that he's a thief. You yeah, preacher, you stole a little thing. You know what the Lord said? See, you're still a little thing. You just might steal a thief. big thing, bud. You better repent. You better get it right. And you better get it right right now. That's just a little old thing, probably worth maybe 75 cents at the most. But if you'll steal a little thing, bud, you'll steal a big one. And I said, God, you're right. If I'm going to steal a little thing, I'm liable to steal something great big. If I do that, I'm going to be in big trouble. You with me? Don't ever steal any money out of daddy's pocket or out of mama's purse. You say, why is that? That's what I used to do. <laughs> Come in, daddy be in there and I go through his pants pockets and boy, man, did he have the change. Well, I go there and man, I get rich in daddy's pants pockets until he says, where's all my change gone? And immediately he say, that's Nathan. They didn't say it's Gary, didn't say it's Glenn, didn't say it's Kenneth. That's Nathan. I remember the first time I ever stole anything. Went down to a store. Went down that store. Right up there was a big old stand. There was some bubble gum right there. I went in there. I was in the second grade for the second time, I believe. <laughs> Went up, went right in there, took that piece of bubble gum, was going out the door, had it in my pocket, had it in my hand, and was going out the door like that. And that guy grabbed me on the shoulder and said, Hey, where are you going with the bubble gum? And I said, I've had it. I have been caught. I mean, I had a conviction over top of me. I felt like that God had just left me and that I had sinned the biggest sin in all the world. Because I knew I was sinning against God. And that guy caught me red-handed. And I said, I ain't going to... long time after this. I was 16 years old when I stole the next thing. <laughs> you say a thief? Yeah! You ever get caught stalled with stealing he hubcaps? I used to go around and steal hubcaps off a car at midnight. I used to go up to the house and steal milk off the front porch. Get that milk and drink that milk off the front porch. You say, what did you do? If it ain't careful, going to make you a thief. Thank God I got saved. Thank God I got saved. I would have been thrown in prison for being a thief. I'm sure of it. <laughs> So what do you do? Don't you steal nothing. Next time you're out on the job and the boss says, well, you take care of this and take care of that, don't you take that home from work and put it in your garage. That's stealing from your boss. And if I catch you, I'd fire you. Say amen. That's a thief. The fellow says, it's just part of the job. No, it ain't. That thing cost 50 or 60 bucks or more. You'd be surprised how many guys got a bunch of junk in their garage that come from the factory they work at. Sneak it out the back door, sneak it in. One guy said, I'd take it home in the lunchbox, in my lunchbox. Man, there's a judgment day coming for thieves. You better not do that. Look at it again. 
in Ephesians, let him that steals, steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. Write down the word laziness. Wounded in the house of my friends, laziness. You know what a lot of Christians are? They won't work with their hands, they're lazy. They get lazy. I have no respect for a lazy man. I want you to come out there and work with me some night. Indeed. And come out there and work with me. One of the guys says, Preacher, aren't you ever going to quit? I'm not going to quit till the day is ended, and I'm not going to quit then. I'm going to go like killing snakes. I believe that every Christian, every Christian, ought to be the best worker on the job, ought to work the hardest on the job, the fastest on the job, the bestest on the job, and do ten times better. I think he ought to work like he owns the job. I work like it belongs to me. Somebody said, Preacher, you act like this thing belongs to you. I said, I'd do that when I was welding. I think that's the way you ought to work. And you say, yeah, go, go, just killing snakes. Go as fast, as hard as I can. I go out there, and I go out there, and I see this great big round post, about this big around. It's a fence post that goes about 400 yards, about 600 yards. And it was a corner post, had two of them there. And I said, I'm going to dig them out of there. And I go up there and look at them and say, man, that's a lot of work. I did this last week. <laughs> man, that's a lot of work. So I says, use your head. I don't always use my head. <laughs> so I took a handyman jack, took a chain to around that post, and then I jacked it and jacked it and jacked it and I put a board under it and jacked it and jacked it and jacked it. And that post started coming up out of the ground with that Andy man jack and jacked it, jacked it, jacked it. I said, ha, 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 jacked that baby right up out of the ground. And I said, man, this baby's hard to carry. How am I going to carry it way over to the trailer? I took a chain and hooked around it. And I went, Got up on the truck. Got up on the train. Did the next one the same way. <laughs> Coming right out of the ground. Put a chain around it. <laughs> You're too old for this. <laughs> You're too old for this. You're dumb. <laughs> You're stupid. Who are you doing this for? <laughs> well, I'm doing it for the Lord. I roll it down in there and get it up on the trailer. Go out there and rake the grass, get it all smoothed out. And I'm smoothing it down through there. I hit this piece of concrete. And I go, well, oh, oh, man, I about broke my foot. And I said, man, that thing's in the ground. So I cleaned it off, and it gets wider and wider and wider. It's about this big. And I said, I'll just cover it up. Cover it up, and something says, well, what if some of those kindergarten kids hit that piece of concrete? They'll knock out their teeth. They'll hammer their head. They'll come up cut. Dig it out, preacher. Yeah, okay. So I get a shovel. I start digging it around it. I got a foot deep. Around it, it goes around like this. About that big. I said, man, a foot. Man, look how big it is. So I dig another foot. There's two foot. I dig another foot. There's three foot. I dig another. It's four feet deep in the ground. I said, it's going to take a semi to get that baby out of there. How am I going to get it out? Put my foot up on it. I go, ah, and shoved it over and it cracked in three places. <laughs> I can get those out of there. Put a chain on it. Uh, get about a drag and drag it and drag it. Put it on the trailer. You see, what are you doing that for? Because God has unsaved people that work like a dog for the devil. Then God ought to have saved people that work like a dog for him. Got me? Laziness grieves the Holy Spirit. Laziness wounds the, uh, in his hands. Some Christians are so lazy it's pathetic. You ever meet a lazy Christian? He, he kind of walks like this. Got a certain walk to him. That's what it is, just a certain walk. And when I see it, 
When I see it, you ever see it? Anybody ever see it? When I see it, I, inside of me, I get mad. I get mad and I want to yell. Get the lead out of your britches! And get up and move! You're getting paid for it! You're getting paid big bucks! Big bucks I'm paying you, now get to going! This drives me crazy. And a Christian? Lazy? A lazy Christian? You know what happens to you as a Christian? If you ain't careful, you'll get lazy. Get a real bad case of laziness. It's lazy-itis. You get old, you get, yeah, you shouldn't get old, you shouldn't get lazy any time in your life. When you get to a certain age, how many of you are over 40? Raise your hand. Then watch out for getting lazy. I'm in. You'll, you'll get, get lazy unless you get there and say, well, I can get here and I can quit and I can just give me on again. You're lazy. And it shouldn't be lazy. Right down for the end, you ought to be doing something for God Almighty and you'd be working as best you can. Right to the end, give it your best shot. When your back goes and your knee goes and your elbow goes... <laughs> And your brain goes, be doing something for God Almighty. Be giving it your best shot. Give it your best. Be religious about everything you do, religiously. Don't be lazy. What for? Well, that you may have to give to him that needeth. That brings up the next one, stinginess. <laughs> that you may have. Did God say that? Look at your Bible. I want you all to look at your Bible. That you may have to give to him that what? Need is. Now, if you're, you know what? I say, I want you to give somebody something. And you're going. There's two kinds of folks. You know what they are? They're the flints. They're the sponges. <laughs> and they're the honeys. The flints. You have to hammer them to get something out of them. And they always spark when you do. <laughs> and the sponges. You got to squeeze them to get something out of them. The more you squeeze them, the more you get. <laughs> and then there's the honeys. They just flow with honey. They just love to give. Now, which one are you? You the flint? Just as tight and hard. You can't give that guy to give for love and the money. He's a getter. Get, 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 get. Me, 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 me says to give to him that needeth. Stinginess wounds the Savior. You know what you ought to learn how to be? I've learned that most folks can either give or they can get. We have a bunch of folks that just, I'm looking for something to get something for nothing. I want a good deal. I want something for nothing. I'll get something for nothing. I'm going to get all I can and can all I get and sit on a can when I'm through. American people spend money they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> now, brethren, don't you be stingy. You have a heart that gives and gives and gives and gives to the Lord. Say, oh, Lord, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. He loves the guy that gives grudgingly. There it is. Oh, I, I know, Lord, I got to give. You're going to kill me if I don't give. Where'd you hear that one at? But I never told you that. <laughs> and neither did he. <laughs> there it is, Lord. Now, he loves that fellow too. But he loves the guy a little bit more that gives cheerfully. Say amen. God loves all the children, don't he? How many of you ever had a guy come up and say, 
Now, in Malachi chapter 3, if you don't give, you're a God robber and you're robbing God. How many have ever heard that one? It's in the Old Testament. You know what the New Testament says? God loves a cheerful giver. And you're to give cheerfully just because you love the Lord. How many say, I love Jesus? Uh, come on, folks. <laughs> I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Got it? So next time that plate comes by, oh, we don't have a plate here. He has it back in the back. <laughs> next time you walk out the door, say, Lord, thank you. I can't ever outgive you. I can't ever outgive you. That's what it says to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Give, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. And let all what? All bitterness. All bitterness. So the Lord on this side says, don't be bitter. And you give place to the devil on this side, he says, you got a right to be bitter. They've, 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 they've done this, and you've got a right to be bitter. He whispers, get them. They got you, you get them. Be bitter, be bitter. Do you know what it tells every husband in this building to do? And it tells them to do one particular thing. Every man, every man that is a husband, raise your hand. Do you know the Bible tells you to do one thing? Be not bitter against your wife. Do you know that? Why? Because the tendency is to say, You're stupid. What are you doing? Where are you going? What are you're, you're a, from the planet Venus. <laughs> and then get bitter about it. And then hold the grudge against her. And keep it. You know what I do when I get mad? I don't want to talk about it. She says, I want to talk about it. And then something says, Talk with her about it because you know you can't study, you can't preach, and you can't think unless you talk to her about it. And I go over to my office and say, I'll study all, all, and I can't study 10 minutes. And I say, Oh, I can't study a lick. I have to go tell her I'm sorry. Go back over. She says, Louise, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just got mad and I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me. Will you please? She says, Nathan, you're forgiven. I love you. Now, we go on. One day I got mad at her. Walked out the door and I said, Drop dead! Climbed the door. <laughs> I walked out the door. <laughs> I had about ten steps going. Some says, what if she does? <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, if she does, it'll kill me. Oh, God, please don't do that to her. You know, I need her. Lord, I need her. Don't do that, Lord. And I walked right back in. And I said, I'm sorry. That was stupid of me. I just said something. I didn't even know what I was saying. I was just stupid. Lord, I call her Lord sometimes, too. <laughs> Louise, please forgive me. <laughs> you say, what is it? You can't get bitter. You gotta you gotta forgive and you gotta forget and you gotta go on. My last verse, and be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Tender hearted. Tender hearted. Tender hearted. Don't be hard hearted. Don't be stiff. Don't be hard. Don't say, I won't forgive you. I won't forgive you. I'll, hold it. I'll remember this forever. Don't say that. 
Say, I'll forgive and I'll forget and I'll go on. She's tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. As has God forgiven you some things? How many of you say, God, forgive me some uh, big things? Raise your hand. He forgive you some big things. Did he do it unconditionally? With no strings attached? Don't you look at him and say, I'll forgive you if. That ain't what the Lord said to you. Did the Lord say, I'll forgive you if you do this, 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 and 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 maybe I'll forgive you? Or did the Lord say, yes, I'll forgive you. Yes, God, Jesus Christ, is in the forgiving business. And He forgives you just like that with no strings attached. That's what you're to do. To keep from wounding. I was wounded in the house of my friends. If you don't forgive, you will wound Jesus Christ. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Now, Christian, you don't want to wound him. You don't want to wound him. You don't want to hurt him. And you want to get the victory. You don't want to give place to the devil. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You want Jesus Christ to give you a smile and be happy with you. Because he's your friend. And you want to be a better friend. And I know you do. Now as I sing to God, if there's anything at all between you and the Lord, and there's something you want to deal with him about, he's your friend, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to do it. Don't wait. Say, okay, Lord, I've been just kind of bitter, unforgiving, mad, and I've just been wounding you. I'm sorry, Jesus. Jesus, I want you to right now say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to say one more thing. Never again. Never again. Is there something you want to stop for? Him? How about it? Let's all stand, take your hymnal, and turn the page. 390. 390. 390 in your hymnal. Next time you sin, Christian, and it's probably right around the corner somewhere, next time you do, I want you to go by there and say, Lord, not this one. Lord, give me a new one. Give me a new one. Not this one. Lord, give me a new one. He'll show it to you in a heartbeat. It's probably there. It's probably there. He'll show it to you. Now, will you? Let's sing. God spoke to your heart, come on. God spoke to your heart, come on. Now, brethren, sometimes a Christian will just kind of put things off. Kind of think, well, it'll it'll just take care of itself. It's kind of taking care of itself. Now, sometimes you got to do something about it. 
Sometimes you got the Lord's going to say, "I want you to do this. This is what I want you to do about it." Sometimes you got to step out and you got to make an absolute decision and you got to say, "Yes, Lord, I will do something about it." I'm here preaching for you to move and do something. I want to see you do something, people. I don't want you to just sit there and say, "Well, it's a good message," and go out the back door and say, "Well, it's finishing over," and forget about it. I want you to do something about it. Your wounds wound him, wounded in the house of my friends. If you're not going to do anything about it, you'll forget about it. So you walk out the door, you'll forget it. So do something. Get on this old-fashioned altar and say, "God, I got to do something. I need to do it now." Will you? If you haven't done it, if you haven't done it yet, do it now. Do it now. Okay, we've had uh, we've had a port out on us tonight and all week long. We've had blessings on top of blessings. We've been uh, think about all the angles have been covered. I wouldn't know what would be left over. Uh, so I hope that uh, the meeting really uh, stirs you real good, keeps the stir to you. You've been dragging around. You have got no excuse now. And let's uh, let's move the right way strongly and let's get let's try to win a lot of souls for the Lord. Okay, let's not just uh, you know. Love being saved. Let's see how many people we can win to the Lord Jesus Christ this year, okay? Let's try to have a good year that way. Uh, don't forget now, Tuesday night, uh, 6.30, we'll be out of here. We'll cover some territory and get a few gospel tracks out, maybe a chance to witness again. And uh, let's get the year started off real good. If you make it, make it. More the merrier, and it'll be a, it'll be a blessing to you. And perhaps you win someone the Lord. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, some of y'all made it in two, three, four times. Some of y'all got them, I think, about every service, and it's been worth your while, I'm sure. Uh, it's just been, uh, it's been a blessing beyond words, and can't thank the Lord enough for it in my heart. I cannot thank the Lord enough for the meeting we've had this week. Lord is good, no doubt about that. Okay, uh, let's bow our heads now, closing prayer. It is dark now. And I'd like to ask you to be careful again. Uh, keep up with your children because they've got a lot of energy. They've been sitting down now for an hour and a half, and they're raring to go. And make sure you know where your children are at, lest uh, we should have some sort of an accident that we don't want. Uh, so be careful with your children, will you? Okay, John Evans, close it on. Thank you.
board for what he's done. Uh, for my wife, Lord, and I thank you for her. And Lord, I think about Hezekiah, Lord, and uh, uh, his love for you. And Lord, I know about life. I know that my wife loves you. And Lord, I know she loves the Word of God. And Lord, uh, I thank you for her. And God, uh, again, she's laying in bed tonight. God, I pray you give her a special blessing from your word. And Lord, uh, I just pray, God, you uh, clean out any infection that might be hiding in her body. And Lord, just uh, strengthen her this, this hour. And Lord, I thank you for uh, doing what you did. Lord, I pray for Dan Matt and his family. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that, uh, that she was a saved Amish lady. She wasn't trusting in her good works to get her to heaven. Lord, uh, all the time she came down to the house, Lord, I just pray, God, another Amish person would be saved uh, through her death somehow. God, may Jesus Christ somehow get glory uh, uh, from her testimony. And again, Lord, I thank you for Brother Nathan and his honesty. Lord, help us not, if he didn't cover a specific sin we have trouble with tonight, Lord, help us to realize, God, that um, uh, as far as him down on our number, Lord, help us remember that our sin does wound the Lord Jesus Christ. And God help us to remember uh, that word, wound, as far as every time we read our Bible or hear it, Lord, help us to remember, Lord, that we wound our Savior, Lord, when we sin against Him. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, His ministry. Thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing Him this way. God, I pray for Him now as He heads back to Montana. God, you give Him a safe flight. Uh, may everything just go as smooth as it did uh, on the way down here. And again, Lord, uh, uh, we pray for Jamison. I pray for that, Lord, this summer. God, that uh, uh, your work would go out. I pray, Lord, a lot of, uh, a lot of people would get saved. Lord, even if they don't, God, I just pray those Lord, and keep putting the Word of God out. Uh, Lord, there's always a chance when the Word of God goes out. I pray you bless that this summer. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Martin. Thank you, Lord, again, for our church. Thank you, Lord, for our health. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. And the Lord, help us to look for this soon return. Lord, again, I just pray as we go our separate ways. Lord, God, the revival's not over. Something that took place this week in our heart, God, as we think about it this week and put it into practice. I pray, Lord, that you watch us as we go home. Uh, uh, keep your eye on us, Lord. We really need you. God, we're nothing without you. And Lord, again, we just pray your blessing upon this place. In Jesus Christ's name we ask you. Amen. Amen, and thank you so much for coming our way.